You just press the dot, right? Yep, it's recording. Huh? It's recording. Oh, okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, here, let me uh, put you in there and two cameras. Is okay, so, um, open the one, two, three, five, four, three. Um, because this is an age when um, the students know how to get uh, PDFs of books from the internet free, I decided to use two books. Um, the first book is Weinberg's Quantum Theory of Fields, um, Volume 1. And the second one is Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell by uh, Anthony Z. Um, they're both very good books. Uh, the Weinberg book is detailed, and in particular, one of the nice things about Weinberg is that, well, he's so smart and he writes so well, and um, actually his intelligence is to some extent a disadvantage because he um, can explain things that other people can't explain or don't have the time to explain, and he explains them. And that means then that there are some very subtle points that he goes through in detail, points that in a first course on quantum field theory one could skip, or uh, the first reading of the book one could skip. Um, the book by Z is the opposite um, in that, um, well, it's also well written, but Z's approach is um, super friendly. He basically um, explains things in such a way that uh, he really makes the material uh, accessible. Um, what I plan to do is to cover um, the essential points uh, in Weinberg's treatment, and then um, add in some stuff from Z's book. I think that's the initial point. You uh, let me. Is is there anybody here who has? Well, let, just in case you don't know where to get books. Um, you can, as far as I know, you can find both books there. Um, b-ok.org. Um, some of you may know better sites. Does anybody know a better site? Library Genesis. Could you say it again? Library Genesis. Um, could you, could you, you write it down? Because it's oh, I don't know. Exactly. Actually, uh, you no. know, with email addresses, if you get anything wrong, then you're in trouble. I don't know the exact thing. Well, Does that have both articles as well as books? Um, yeah, you can search it for articles too. Okay, thank you. By the way, another place is, what is it called? Sci-Hub? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think that's what it is. The place that has articles? Sci-Hub.org? Okay, you just, just Google Sci-Hub. Yeah, well, it's tricky. I mean, if you Google Sci-Hub, um, for legal reasons, Google doesn't may not lead you to either of these sites. That's why I wrote them down. But um, um, I will try to give you. I don't, we're not going to be searching that much for articles, but um, it's it's um, nice to have uh, the exact references, the exact websites, although they may change for legal reasons. Maybe I should say illegal reasons. Um, <laughs> okay, um, now the first chapter of Weinberg's book is a very nice uh, historical uh, description of the invention of quantum field theory, and I urge you all to just read it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's better for you to read it than for me to try to 
go through it in in class because I'd have to I'd have to um, I'd have to uh, essentially say every repeat every word that's in the chapter as um, essentially anyway it reads like a novel and um, but with equations and um, it's it's worth it's certainly worth reading, but I don't think we need to do it in class. Um, there's a class web page, and um, if I remember correctly, it is, uh, well, I've sent, I, anybody who's registered for the course got an email from me saying what the website is, and I think it's that slash Oh, 523-18. I think that will do it. I think. Um, anyway, it's in the email that I sent to all the register, all people who had registered. Now, the a few months ago, I was thinking of a certain research project that I never actually spent any real time on, but. When I was thinking about it, what I was struck by is um, something that some writer said about some city 70 or 80 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, and the statement was, there's no there there. And um, it's, it's, I guess it's the opposite that's true of quantum field theory, because I mean, in the sense that to a remarkable degree, quantum field theory follows from a very small set of ideas. And um, of course, that's one of the reasons why we like uh, physics. Uh, it's the opposite of, say, law, um, law where you need enormous library of books and case histories and so forth. In physics, you just need uh, Maxwell's equations and to do many things. Maxwell's equation plus F equals MA gets you by. Um, and um, for in, in quantum field theory, let me, in fact, Weinberg goes through what's basically, what, what it's based on. And it's based, first of all, on quantum mechanics. Secondly, on uh, special relativity. And thirdly, um, extracted from quantum mechanics, um, analogous to the, uh, the canonical commutation relations of quantum mechanics, uh, there are the, there's the idea that the, that the variable qi is replaced by something that depends upon the space point, and the qi's of course depend upon time. So the, the analogous, the analog of qi is a field at uh, xi, and the qi's are emission. These are emissions. The analog of pi we call pi, and this would be xj, and this is actually an equal time commutator. In other words, the q's and the p's are at the same time, really. And so this commutator is i delta ij uh, times h bar. By the way, I'm, I'm going to be setting h bar and c to the 1 throughout. Um, uh, would anybody like me to describe natural units? The basic thing is you said C equal to 1 means that you're measuring distance in light seconds, and uh, so a light nanosecond is about a foot. Um, and um, you're measuring uh, energy in inverse seconds. Um, and so, since h bar and c are 1, when you get an answer, 
that involves masses and other and coupling constants and numbers and other things. You, and then you know that this thing has to be a time or a length or an area or something. You just spring, you use the, you use C and H bar as like salt and pepper, and you season the thing until you get the dimensions right. And um, there's, only, there's a unique set of H bars and C's that you multiply and divide by that will give you the right dimensions. And um, so then, um, uh, H bar becomes one. Normally, um, we'll be going to the continuum approximation, which well, I should say the continuum limit, which um, is what we naturally deal with in classical physics. We just assume that space and time are continuous, whether they are or not. Nobody really knows, but in any event, what's normal in quantum field theory is to um, uh, write it this way, then I, and then it would be a three-dimensional delta function of x minus x prime, and um, so that's the the other. That's for a scalar field for for. Um, Spinner field, of course, fermion fields, you haven't said an anti commutation relation. We'll get into that, of course, later. Um, now, one of the things that Weinberg does in detail in chapter two is to uh, talk about quantum mechanics uh, and put quantum mechanics and relativity together in a way that actually um, normally isn't done. You normally do non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and then you do the Dirac equation to put in special relativity. What Weinberg does is um, to talk about, in chapter two, to talk about um, uh, relativity in the context of quantum mechanics and how states of single particles or several particles transform under Lorentz transformations. And uh, that then forms the basis. Once you know how that works, you then um, extrapolate from how straight states transform to how creation operators transform. Because the creation operator of let us say k on zero gives you this state k. So you've seen the, the, the vacuum's invariant under Lorentz transformations. If you know how this transforms, then you know how this transforms. And then the fields are linear combinations of these and their adjoints, the annihilation operators. And uh, so then you know how the fields transform. Um, most books on quantum, mechan on quantum field theory don't really describe or make clear why the fields transform, and in some cases, even how they transform. Um, So um, let's just um, look for a moment. I'm going to be following Weinberg for a minute here, or for a few minutes. Uh, he has he uses a notation uh, like this, and the corresponding Dirac notation is like that. And um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why he opted for this. Um, I think part of the reason is that people have been typically overly rigid using Dirac notation. And what has been common in this notation is, for example, to say that, um, that this inner product is linear, you would do this. that this is equal to a phi psi plus b phi psi prime. So this is the way Weinberg writes, expresses the linearity of the inner product. Of course, the inner product is the key thing in quantum mechanics. Absolute value squares of inner products are all the probabilities. But you can equally well do this in um, direct notation. You just 
do it this way. And you can do it in two ways. This one way is to just write it this way, and I think people should use direct notation this more general way. Um, and of course, what this means is um, is phi parenthesis a psi plus b. So this is a little more general notation. Um, any event, this inner product, as you know, is um, such that, let's see, I do, you guys don't want me to be writing both notations all the time. Do you want me to use Weinberg's or Dirac's for the rest of the lecture? Dirac. All right, let's go with Dirac. Um, So, uh, oh, and here I changed it to something that was Deerberg or, or Wine Rack instead of Dura. <laughs> um, and um, the other thing about uh, this is that A5 plus B5 prime psi is A bar phi psi plus p bar phi psi prime. So it's linear in the right element, anti-linear in the left element. Now, um, as you know, the probability that a state that is a system known to be in the state phi is also in the state psi, or is, is that if you do a measurement of it, you'll find it to be in the state psi, is the absolute value of psi phi uh, squared. And um, these states describe our, the states represent our knowledge of the system. So, in other words, by our knowledge, that's, it's a mathematical representation of our knowledge of the system, and, um, and in fact, it's also, if, it's, if it actually is a state, then we're saying that we have complete knowledge of the system, because this is what's called a pure state sometimes. And um, so it's complete knowledge. And since, since that's our complete knowledge of the system, it doesn't make any sense to say that we have twice as much knowledge because the knowledge is complete. Or um, if you have a person, for example, his name is David, we'd say that's David. We don't say that he's very David or to David or something. Uh, and that's why. Presumably, that's why quantum mechanics, we don't care about the um, magnitude of a vector. Effectively, um, all vectors, all, um, this is a vector in Hilbert space, all in some vector space, complex vector space. Uh, we don't uh, say that it has, um, we say that the same knowledge is represented by the vector no matter how long it is. And in fact, when we're actually doing computations, it's convenient to normalize all the states and then take their inner product. In fact, that's what's assumed here because the real formula here is that this should be divided by, uh, by that and by that. Well, I didn't need the absolute values because these things are intrinsically positive. Um, um, you should feel free to ask questions. I had candy 
I throw candy to students who ask questions. All right, well, um, Vigna long ago, and probably about 50 years ago, or 70 years ago, or 80 years ago, uh, showed um, that if you have a symmetry, that means that you have either a unitary or an anti-unitary transformation. So let me say what, what is meant by this. Um, First of all, what is a symmetry? A symmetry means that you've got some states here, psi i, and then another state, another set of states, psi prime i. And um, in fact, if I, let me put the prime here and take it away there. And um, the point here is that if the inner products or the absolute value of the inner products of psi prime i with psi prime j are the same as with psi i and psi j, then this is what's called a symmetry. Um, Weinberg describes the symmetry as a change in our point of view. Um, there are two ways of thinking about symmetry. Um, the change in one's point of view is um, the way of thinking about symmetry that's most natural in the case of, um, let us say, general relativity, where you want to have, um, you want to consider arbitrary transformations of the coordinates, and so what you're doing is you're just changing your coordinate system in an arbitrary way and um, uh, that change of the coordinate system is a change in one's point of view. Um, somehow in quantum field theory when I think of symmetry, I think more in terms of the active view of a symmetry, namely that uh, the state psi prime might be might be might represent systems over in that corner of the room, and the psi's represent similar systems over in this corner of the room, and the experiments done over here give the same results as the experiments done over there, and that's how I think of translation and uh, symmetry. That is to say, you, you, if you move that system over there, you get the same results as over there. Um, anyway, those are the two versions, two ways of thinking about the symmetry. And what Wigner showed and um, Weinberg um, uh, re-showed or actually proved, apparently Wigner left some stuff out. And it's basically that this trend, if you have a symmetry, the symmetry can either be represented by unitary transformations that are linear. So U is linear, which means, of course, U on A psi plus, well, I better not use the prime. So that's linear, and um, unitary means u phi u psi is the same thing as phi psi. Sorry, I by mistake used um, wine rack notation. Okay, so. Now, basically, these linear and unitary uh, these linear and unitary operators represent can represent all symmetries in physics except the ones that involve time reversal. So there's something really spooky about time reversal, and they're represented then by anti-linear, anti-unitary transformations. And so, let me say what they are. So if you have something. 
something that's anti-linear and anti-unitary, what we mean here is 3 phi a psi is equal to um, so this is anti-linear and well first of all anti-linear of course means that a on a psi i plus b psi j is a star a on psi i plus b bar or b star a on psi j. So the complex conjugates things and then the uh, anti-unitary uh, part is that this is actually um, phi psi complex conjugate. Whereas if this were unitary, there'd be no complex conjugation there, and if it were unitary, there'd be no complex conjugation here. So these very these very strange um, this ant so in other words. Symmetries that can't be represented by linear and unitary transformations can be represented by anti-linear, anti-unitary transformations. And uh, this is anti-linear, that's anti-unitary. Um, and as far as I know, the only symmetries that, the only transformations that require, or the only symmetries that require anti-unitary, anti-linear transformations are the ones that involve time reversal. And so that, that makes things um, nice. Now, what about the definition of a, um, of the adjoint of a transformation? Well, in general, what we do is we say phi L dagger psi is L phi psi. So this is the adjoint of a linear operator. On the other hand, if we have an anti-linear operator, then what we say is that the adjoint on psi is um, psi a psi, a phi, which is to say a phi psi complex conjugate. Okay. Now, so let me assign a, a homework problem um, Do I don't know, when should it be due? Or let me say what the problem is. It's um, show that um, In both cases, uh, if you have a unitary operator, then U adjoint is U inverse, and if you have an anti-unitary operator, then K dagger is also A inverse. So in other words, this was the definition of the adjoint for an anti-linear operator, so I'm saying for an anti-unitary operator, show that the adjoint is the inverse, just as for, as you must have seen many times in class, that uh, the adjoint of a unitary operator is its inverse. Okay. Um, I'm going to go over very quickly something that Weinberg um, talks about, but that I think is something that's um, something that only he would think about. Anyway, uh, let's think about a unitary, a linear unitary operator near the identity. Then what we do in physics classes is um, we have this fetish of sticking in an eye and the re and this is real and small. And uh, so then this T is her mission. And this is just the identity operator. So for symmetry transformations, 
that are um, unitary and uh, linear, we can write, and if they're very small transformations, in other words, a, a, a translation by a nanometer or a, um, a rotation by uh, uh, such things, we'd say would be would, would involve uh, written in this way, and uh, the T would be Hermitian. And um, many, if not all, of the operate of the physical observables in physics that we talk about are of this form. They're what we call this T is called the generator of the symmetry transformation. The the whole transformation would be u of say theta would be e to the i theta t. And so for theta equal to epsilon you get that. For finite theta you have this. Um, most, if not all, of the operators of physics are of this form. So in quantum mechanics, um, symmetry really plays a key role. And in fact, if you think about quantum mechanics um, a little bit, how, what is different from classical mechanics or from common sense, this business about inner products and probabilities and absolute values, that's all sort of plausible in a classical context. In other words, you could represent your knowledge of something by a point in some big space. And in fact, um, one could even do artificial intelligence that way, you just you use a big enough space. Um, um, I somehow thought about something that lost my train of thought. What was I talking about before I went into mentioned artificial intelligence? That's right, that's right, thank you. Um, it's that um, this business of inner products representing probabilities, that could that's kind of, I mean, common sense would lead you to, there's no conflict between that viewpoint and ordinary common sense or ordinary classical physics. What is surprising about quantum mechanics is that, the, is that translations are represented by, for example, E to the I momentum times distance. That's surprising. And the rotations of e to the i, the back of the vector, vector product, trans, uh, rotations about an angle theta are represented in this way. This is what's distinctive about quantum mechanics and so and quantum field theory. And so you see it's related to this business of symmetry and emission operators. One thing that Weinberg mentions is that um, First of all, of course, if you have symmetries, uh, if you have a certain symmetry uh, transformation, then um, you can follow it by another symmetry transformation. And that's the same thing as some symmetry transformation. I mean, if this takes, for example, if, if u of t2, u of t1, you expect that this is u of t21. In other words, this states, right, let me get the other eraser. In other words, if Let's just let's do it more slowly. Suppose u of t1 takes our psi states psi i to psi 1 sub i. And then uh, u of t2 takes um, psi 1 sub i into psi 2 1 sub i. Then, of course, what you've got is that u of t2 on u of t1 on psi i is 
psi to one sub i. On the other hand, u of t to one on psi i would also be u t one i apart maybe from a phase, a phase. And what Weinberg shows um, is that the phase is a property of the, um, in other words, you could say that this thing was, I will be right it down in this function, sorry. You could wind up saying u of t2, u of t1, by any state side was the I some phase that depended upon uh, T1, T2, and psi times U of T2, T1 psi. Well, it, it turns out that the, that you can show that unless there's a super selection rule, and the super selection rule is um, a rule saying that you can't add certain states together to each other. You know, normally we say we can take, we have the, the, our states in quantum mechanics in the Hilbert space, uh, form a vector space, so if psi and psi prime are in the space, then this state, psi double prime, is another state in the space. But, and normally we do this happily and so forth, and we think of it as a basic effect principle of quantum mechanics. On the other hand, it may be that some, um, that there are some kinds of states that we can't do this with. And the example is, um, for example, states of, um, that are uh, bosonic and fermionic. And um, the reason why this might not work is that if you have a rotation here of 2 pi, Hitting this, if this one's bosonic, this one just gives back two pi rotation on the bosonic state just gives you back the state. Two pi rotation on the fermionic state gives you a minus sign. And so you'd be saying that a rot uh, the two pi rotation on this state changes into a different linear combination of states. And so many people think that therefore you can't add states representing bosons and states representing fermions. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um, if, uh, as long as you can add states together, then um, what, what, um, what Weinberg shows is that this phase can be the same for all states. And consequently, uh, you can basically just absorb it into um, the definition of the unitary operator or the definition of the states. Anyway, we don't normally, we normally just assume that that is how it works and Weinberg points out that there's a reason for that. Yeah? That phase isn't necessarily just like a, it's not, it's not an exponential of a scalar in general, right? I mean, what, what are you talking about now? Uh, what like, phase? Like, well, well, this e to the i phi that you wrote down. Yeah, I, 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 I just, I just made e to the i phi where this is, um, this is just a real number. No, it's a space factor. Okay. It could be a phase uh, factor here. But Weinberg shows that the phase factor is effectively ignorable. But generally, that's if t1 and t2 like commute up to like first order commutators, right? No, these two these t's could be totally non-commuting. Okay. These could be rotations about different axes. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about this like Baker Campbell Hausdorff expansion that you can. <laughs> And you have like all these net, you have all these nested commutators. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's uh, it, that's kind of different than this, right? But in, in such a case, 
like I don't know, like like looking at this general like figure. Well, no, but you were saying u of t one times u of t two. That's a product of two unitary <laughs> operators, and this one does one symmetry transformation. This does a different one, and so the effect of that is the same as the as the unitary operator that represents doing first t1 and then t2 and so they have to be the same apart from a possible phase that's the idea okay but you get a candy <laughs> and um So the u's aren't necessarily the same. Maybe it's just misleading because you've written u t one, u t two. U. Well, u is a unitary operator that represents a symmetry transformation t one, and then u of t two is a unitary operator that represents a symmetry transformation t two. Okay. You should, um, since I'm. Sort of, I'm going over the early sections of chapter two. You should download a PDF of the book and read those sections. Uh, I, I think all of you should. And um, as I've mentioned a couple of places where you can gloss over things a little bit, but it would be a good idea in general to read them. Now, where did I put my, my notes? Um, in fact, I've gotten to the end of one set of notes. And I thought that instead of continuing to follow Weinberg carefully, that I would switch and give you a slightly different point of view um, of the same material. That way you'd have two points of view. Right? Um, OK, so the idea is uh, for continuous groups, which are called regroups. And um, what, what one does is, well, first of all, let me say that one talks about representations of the group. So suppose G is a group element, and it's parameterized by some parameters alpha, so alpha 1, alpha 2, whatever. Alpha n, so it might be might be an n parameter group. Um, a rotation might have uh, a rotation group might have three parameters. Now, a representation would it would be uh, typically we, we we write it this way. This is a matrix that uh, represents the group element, the group element being an abstract mathematical quantity, but this being simply a square matrix. And in fact, for simplicity, I'm going to write it this way, D of alpha. So alpha labels the group element, and um, D of alpha is a matrix that represents this group element. And um, if one has a D of um, alpha times g of alpha prime equals g of alpha double prime, say, then one wants these matrices to have to obey the same relation. Namely, that the matrices will be a faithful representation of the multiplication law of the group. This is a very simple multiplication law of translations. It's a more complicated law for rotations, and it's even more complicated if you have Lorentz transformations as well. So I'm thinking of the general case of uh, both rotations and Lorentz transformations and translations, and other things. Um, and then if we have a, so D is, D is, is a matrix that represents the, um, the symmetry transformation or the elements of the group, but um, 
it's an, another thing that I should mention is what one could call U of alpha or U of G of alpha. This would be, again, if we're not dealing with time reversal, this would be the linear unitary operator that represents the uh, symmetry transformation associated with the group element G of alpha. So this is a matrix. And this is like, say, n by n. And in fact, in some cases, it's just one by one if we're talking about uh, the group that occurs in electrodynamics, which is just a phase group, e to the i theta. Um, it's uh, two by two if you're talking about SU2 and things involving spin in um, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. This, on the other hand, is a, un is a linear unitary uh, operator. And if you want to represent this as a matrix, it's typically an infinite, it often is an infinite dimensional matrix. Whereas this is a, th these are typically one by one, two by two, three by three, and or n by n. But they're finite square matrices. These are square, but uh, it's often infinite. And um, these are unitary. These are often unitary. They're unitary for compact groups, non-unitary for non-compact groups. So for rotations, the matrices are unitary. For translations, the matrices are unitary. For Lorentz transformations in this, well, Lorentz transformations can be either rotations or boosts. The ro for rotations, it's unitary. Boosts and non-unitary. So, um, now, how can we represent this uh, group element that's near the identity? Well, if all of the alphas are very small, then, uh, in fact, we'll all, in this course, and in fact, in almost all books on group theory, the idea is if you set all the alphas equal to zero, you get the, you get the group element that's just the identity. Yeah, every group has to have the identity element. And one always assumes, set the parameters equal to zero, you just go back to the identity. Okay, so what about if you're talking about a, uh, an element of the group that's very close to the identity, then this is the n by n identity matrix plus i in order to make things Hermitian. In a math class, we don't, uh, the mathematicians don't have this necessity or this compulsion or this fetish of pulling out the i. They just drop the i and have to deal with things that are not Hermitian. Anyway, this is then alpha, what, what do they call them? Alpha sub A, T sub A. So we call these generators. These alphas are real numbers. I, of course, is square root of minus one. And um, if the D is unitary, then the T's are Hermitian. If, if, but for Lorentz boosts, the T's are going to be anti permission and the D will be will not be unitary. Okay. So um, let me now try to erase some of this. We've got this whiteboard. Maybe I should erase the board. And while the board is drying, I'll use the whiteboard. This is a good time for questions. When I was taking a similar course, or at least a course on the same subject, um, what bothered me was that the professor talked too fast. And I'm just wondering whether I'm talking to a class. No?
Um, Dyson who was one of the founders of quantum field theory um, once wrote in one of his New York Review of Books articles that um, the people who invented quantum field theory were all amazed at how well it worked. Um, and I was saying to you that uh, it's based upon just a few ideas and everything else follows from them. Let me see if I can grab this. Because uh, I can check whether the pen is in my board. And um, it's a very convenient uh, parameterization. The inverse of D of alpha then is just simply E to the minus I. Uh, oh, I left out a sum sign. Sum on A. So that's, uh, that's the inverse. And you can see then that if the t's are Hermitian, the adjoint is the inverse because taking the adjoint, you'd flip the sign of i, but you wouldn't affect the t's if the t's are Hermitian. All right, now, these t's can be represented as, let me get the right notation exactly, minus i, partial derivative of d of alpha with respect to alphas of a for all the alphas equal to zero. So that's a definition of the generator. So if one adopts the, the uh, exponential parameterization, then this is um, how, how um, the generators look. These things are called generators. And they're generators of the Lie group or of the symmetry. Um, let's see, I think we've got. You guys prefer the whiteboard or the black? Okay. Yeah. Doesn't matter. 
All right. Let me, why don't I use the other side of the blackboard to do one thing that's an important property of Lee groups. This is something Weinberg does in his own way, and this I'll be doing it in a slightly different way. So well, oh, here I go with the chalk on the microphone. This doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Let me try black. So suppose we have G of um, The alphas are very, very small, and this is a group element that it just has, in fact, one way of thinking about it would be just to call this alpha sub b. In other words, all the other alphas are zero, just alpha b is there, and alpha b is very small. Then uh, g on alpha sub a times g of minus alpha b, g of minus alpha a. Well, what is this? This is some g of alpha a comma b, where alpha is, is um, some set of n small numbers. This is an n parameter group. Um, if you then have representations, what would you what would you be saying? You'd be saying that d of alpha b, d of alpha a, d of minus alpha b, d of minus alpha a is some d of alpha a b. And now if you have some other representation, you'd have d prime of alpha b. The same thing as this, just primes. So these are two different representations. Now the alphas represent the element of the group. So if you have two representations, they both have to respect the multiplication law. And this is a four term multiple, example of multiplication law. And so what this would look like in the first case, this one would be e to the i alpha b tb. This one would be e to the i alpha a ta. This would be e to the minus i alpha b tb. And e to the minus i alpha a TA, all the alphas being super small. And if you multiply this out, what you find is that a lot of terms, in other words, let me just multiply out some of the terms here. I'll do the first term. 1 plus I alpha B TB minus alpha B squared over 2 TB squared, and then, so the product of all four of those, what is it? Well, there are various things that cancel, and what you have is um, alpha A alpha B times TA TB minus TB TA which is to say 1 plus alpha A alpha B, the commutator of TA with TB. And in, if you do, on the other hand, this case, the other representation, what you would get would be the same thing, but you'd have alpha A, 1 plus alpha alpha A, alpha B, the commutator of T prime A with T prime B. In other words, the D's 
would use generators T prime. This is approximately equal. This is the lowest order in the alphas. The alphas all being very, very small. On the other hand, this thing has to be close to the identity because after all, what we've done is we've gone, if these guys all commuted, this would be exactly the identity. Um, but uh, so, so these guys have to be D alpha has to be um, 1 plus i and then something very small and so let's let's say alpha a alpha b um, something very small times um, some linear combination of um, these. So let me, let me write this down correctly. This one is a sum, and it's a sum over C. So this has to be a linear combination of generators, and it has to be proportional to the two uh, alphas here. And so, so what do we get? What we get are two equations. So let me go to the blackboard now. So we get two equations here. One of them is one plus let me replace the alphas just by epsilon for simplicity. So this is 1 plus epsilon TATB is 1 plus I epsilon squared sum A equals, actually it's C. That's the case for one representation. For the other representation, it's the same thing just with some primes. And um, the point is that it's the same, the same Fs because uh, there's only one multiplication law, that is to say the GB, GA, G minus GB, minus GA, um, you just get this G of alpha AB. And so it's the same coefficients here in both cases. And what that tells us is that the generators of a continuously group have to satisfy a uh, formula, a formula of the form where these things are called the structure constants. So the commutator of any two generators is a linear combination of the generators and the f's are the structure constants. And what we see here is that the structure constants have to be the same for every representation of the group. So in other words, the over here, these might be two by two matrices, matrices that are two by two, these might be seven by seven. But the alphas, which refer to the abstract group, the alphas are all the same. And consequently, the f's uh, are the same. The structure constants are the same. And um, what one can do next is one can say, well, one can rescale the generators so that they are Um, orthogonal, but not orthonormal. And the reason you don't want them to be orthonormal is that 
every representation, no matter how big or what form, it has to have the same structure constants. And so the K can vary with, from representation to representation. And what one can do um, with this is one can one can come, take this relation here, multiply by T D dagger, and then take the trace. So this you may think this is H bar. And in fact, I once missed a lecture when I was a graduate student and um, when I came back, I saw that form on the board, and I thought that the professor had gotten around to introducing H bar, but in fact, he was talking about trace. Let me, let me write it as trace. So if we take the trace of the commutator with TD dagger, what we've got is a, an I, a sum I, C, A, B, trace, well, I lapse into my H bar traces, trace of um, T, C, T, B, dagger, and so this is uh, delta, uh, this then is I, F, D, A, B, uh, times K. And from this one, you can derive a formula for the structure constants. FCAB is minus I over K trace commutator TA to B TC dagger. So that's the general formula for the structure constants for any Lie group. Um, um, this is not meant to be a course on group theory, and so I'm going to um, make a few observations rather quickly. You see that the commutator is anti-symmetric in A and B. And so consequently, this is minus FC BA. And so in general, this representation of the group is I sum on A alpha A T A T A. These T, if the T's are Hermitian, uh, the alphas by convention are real. If the al uh, since the alphas are real, if the T's are Hermitian, this is unitary. But if the T's aren't Hermitian, it's not unitary. Um, if the group is compact, compact Lie group, then all the T's are Hermitian, and then uh, you don't even need the dagger on the T. And then these F's are not only real, but totally anti-symmetric. Um, they're both real and uh, totally anti-symmetric. That's if the group is compact. In general, it's... Um, not going to be um, compact. Okay, so let, let's look at um, a particular example of a rotation group. What, um, what's the idea of a rotation group? Well, it's that for just just in three-dimensional space, it's a three-by-three three matrix on X gives you X prime, such that X prime I, X prime I is equal to, what did I do here? X prime 
uh, is equal to xj, xj, here we're summing over i, summing over j. And so the state, that's the statement that x prime transpose r transpose r x is equal to, sorry, x prime is equal to x transpose x. And um, I'm sorry, this this is a prime to go This is x prime transpose x prime. And so the the feature is that R transpose R is the identity uh, matrix. That's how they, the, the, the rotation group works. So now if we say we want something near the identity, let omega be a small three by three matrix, and then what do we have? Well, we have one plus omega transpose times one plus omega has to equal one approximately and uh, consequently omega transpose plus omega is equal to zero so that means that omega is anti-symmetric and so there are basically three anti-symmetric three by three matrices omega one is um, Uh, omega two is all oh, the others are zero. Omega three is um, all the others being zero. And in fact, one can say that omega b um, a c is equal to epsilon a b c where epsilon ABC is one, is the levy chibiantau symbol. It's one if ABC is one, two, three. So epsilon. And it's totally anti-symmetric. Um, and what one has then is that uh, these generators, TA, TB, um, let me see how I'm, I'm saying TA is I omega A, then TA, TB will be I at A, B, C, T, C, where um, these are the structure constants of the rotation group, and these are the same thing as I epsilon A, B, C, T, C. And what I've lapsed into here is um, a sloppy notation, namely, if your group is compact, then this, the structure constants not only are real, they're totally anti-symmetric, and so one typically drops the C and just regards it as FABC rather than FC sub AB. Okay, we're basically um, out of time here. Uh, next time, um, I'll, I guess I'll say a little more about group theory and then um, get back to Weinberg's description of, um, the, of how particle states behave on the Lorentz transformations. But I first want to do the, I'll do the Lorentz group in this notation and then draw back to this. Um, so the homework problem should be due when? When do you think? Next Monday, next Tuesday. So the way you handle hand it back is you send it back to stick it in Mr. U's box. He's a nice guy. If you have a uh, disagreement about the grading, talk to him, and you can probably talk him into whatever you want. <laughs> Anyway, um, he's, he's not going to be unfair. I am, as you hear me, maybe we should turn the thing on.